Good morning and welcome on a glorious Sunday morning. I'd like to start out. First of all, this is the first Presbyterian and we are recording this service. So please, um, it's going to be shown on Facebook and our website. So please guard your privacy as best you see fit. And as we start every service, we'd like to acknowledge that our church, the First Presbyterian Church of Barrie, and many of our homes are located on the unceded and ancestral homes of the Abnaki people. We acknowledge that they are still here today, continuing to bring honor and light to their heritage, and we benefit every day from the theft of their land. prayer that's often taught to children where you place the archangels all around you the corners of the building or because we're outside maybe around us so Mikael is on your right Gabriel is on your left Raphael Archangel of Healing is behind you and Uriel the wisdom the white light is in front of you Mikael Gabriel, come Raphael, come Uriel. Be by my side, there's a place for you here. Be by my side, there's a place for you Reverend Simon, that was just beautiful. What a wonderful way to start our day. And welcome again, First Presbyterian Church of Barry. Welcome to all of those folks that are here in person and on Zoom and watching at a later date. We want to have a special thank you to Lee Bonamico hosting us and her beautiful lawn. This is the first of our season this summer. Um, what a beautiful sunny day it is. And we have a special guest here today as well. Hiding there under the eave is Ella. So be sure to say hi to Ella um, after the service. So um, so welcome and thank you. And oh, oh, also, welcome to Reverend Simon DeVoe, who you've all seen before. And we're just so grateful to have you here to share your, your, your beautiful music and also your blessings. So thank you. Um, and we'll hear later today about um, parables and seeds that grow. And that just reminds me of um, the gardening that I try to do every year. And so uh, being the vegetable gardener that I am, I, you know, on Memorial Day or thereabouts, plant, plant many seeds and 
some of them are successful, but not all of them. And every year it's a surprise, like this year, um, great success with the beans and the peas coming up, but I have no idea why the cucumbers didn't. So I spent some time re-sowing seeds yesterday, and I was thinking about um, a service today. So I'm hoping you'll give me some enlightenment why some of my <laughs> seeds just don't come up. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Reverend Simon for our opening prayer. This is a prayer by one of my favorite mystics, Teresa of Avila. She lived 500 years ago in Spain. She said, Christ, you are within each of us. We are your temple, not made with hands. We are your body. And if every wall should crumble and every church decay, we are your habitation. Nearer are you than breathing, closer than hands and feet, and ours are the eyes with which you look out with compassion on this world. We'll move into our call to worship. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. This is one of my favorite by the Reverend Desmond Tutu. Father, mother, and friend, help us to learn that goodness is stronger than evil, that love is stronger than hate, that light is stronger than darkness, that life is stronger than death, that victory is ours through your forgiving love. Amen. And the opening hymn today is number 69, I the Lord of Sky and uh, Sea and Sky. And you should have a little flyer in your bulletin that has the words to the song. Also want to say Happy Father's Day. My father is a very important person in my life, and uh, I think he taught me so many things, but especially gentleness. He taught me to be gentle. So let's pause for a moment and think of the people in our lives who have fathered and nurtured us and give thanks for that. And if they weren't very good, let's send them a blessing. <laughs> We don't all come with equal parents. Would you like to stand and sing? My notes warn me that this is high, so <clears throat> I'll do my best. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you leave me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them, they turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord?
by the Lord of wind and flame. I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will sing. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you leave me, I will. I'm so grateful you sang along because I actually chose a different hymn. But being dyslexic, I got the wrong number. <laughs> and Dorothy wrote to me and said, we don't know that other song. But, but the one that you chose is I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. Everybody likes it. And I was like, OK, I'll play that. So I was so grateful when you sang along. All right. From joviality, let's, let's move into the prayer of confession. And as always, I like to share the words that we would say in the Abbey on Iona. So I'll say, before God, I confess to my brokenness, to the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. Amen. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. And here's the good news, that nothing can fall out of God. It's not possible. The gravity of the earth that holds us together is a symbol of the way that God holds us together. We can pretend that we are not under the influence of gravity and that we are separate entities, but we are bound into one loving human being that God loves and witnesses and brings always towards wholeness. Nothing that we could do can separate us from our Creator. Amen. That's worth celebrating. And a good way to do that is to pass the peace. This is the peace that shows up in war zones, that surprises you and the teenager that you're fighting with. The, <laughs> the joy and the reconciliation that bubbles up in the midst of every situation, no matter how difficult it may appear. Let's share that peace with one another. Peace be with you and also with you. I'm going to gather us back. We're in the garden. This could be the whole service. And that would be a good use of holy time. Hey, before we get into the reading, I just want to say that my, uh, I woke up um, and decided to read a reflection by 
one of my peers, that I'm, I'm on the Wisdom Council of something called Abbey of the Arts, and there was a little message in my inbox when I woke up about um, the mustard seed. And I thought, oh, I'm going to read this. And then after I read it, I was like, I wish I hadn't read that. <laughs> Because um, what, what my friend was saying was that most, it's most likely it wasn't the mustard seed that we know, that it was this thing that they call the toothbrush tree that Jesus was talking about, which is a, sh it is a shrub. Whereas I, I, I I'd based this all on mustard, because I've grown mustard. I'm a gardener too. And uh, I don't have any enlightenment about why your seeds do or don't grow. <laughs> but maybe we could, I could bless you with some extra patience. Um, so, either way, it might be a little uh, kind of brassica type thing that, have you had anybody else grown mustard? It's, it's a bit like a rocket, or a, what do you call that? Arugula. Um, but there's also a, a, an ancient bush that the people in India still use for health reasons. But my wife's a herbalist and she says it doesn't really matter because both plants have amazing healing properties. Okay, so it's either, when we hear this, it's either a small shrub or the little mustard that we're, which only grows about that high that we're used to. Right. Right, and, and thank you for setting the stage for that. So this is the parable, and um, this is Mark chapter 4, and it's 26 through 34. So it's a, slightly incorrect in the, in the bulletin. Um, so this is Jesus speaking to the people. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces it of itself, first the stock, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like the mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of shrubs and puts forth a large branch, large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. This is the word, oh, one more, sorry. The use of parables. <laughs> With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. You all know I speak in songs rather than parables, so I'm going to add to the parable with this song. This is called Holy Now by Peter Mayer. When I was a boy each week, on Sunday we would go to church, pay attention to the priest, and he would read the Holy Word and consecrate the Holy Bread. Everyone would kneel and bow Today the only difference is Everything is holy now Everything, everything Everything is holy now When I was in Sunday school We would learn about the time Moses split the sea in two And Jesus made the water wine I remember feeling sad Miracles don't happen still But now I can't keep track Cause everything's a miracle Everything, everything Everything's a miracle and Wine from water is not so small But an even better magic trick that anything is here at all So The challenging thing becomes Not to look for miracles But finding where there isn't one When holy 
water was rare at best It barely wet my fingertips But now I have to hold my breath Like I'm swimming in a sea of it There used to be a world half there Heaven second-rate hand-me-down But I walk it with a reverent air Cause everything is holy now Everything, everything, everything is holy now Read a questioning child's face And say it's not a testament That it'd be hard to say And see another new morning come Say it's not a sacrament I tell you that it can't be done This morning outside I stood and Saw a little red-winged bird Shining like a burning bush And singing like a scripture verse it Made me want to bow my head I remember when church let out How things have changed since then Cause everything is holy now Everything, everything, everything is holy now. I think that's what this parable is, is about, which is seeing exactly the same world as holy now, rather than heaven's second rate hand me down. I love that label. I love that song. Do you like it? Peter Mayer, check it out. In Luke 17, 20, Jesus also said, the coming of the kingdom is not something that can be observed because the kingdom of God is in your midst. I believe that we have a very real choice whether to contribute towards a living hell here on earth or we can co-create heaven within this world. But it's not so easy as just doing the right thing. Right doing is part of it, it really is. But with so many other people that all have different opinions <laughs> and see things differently, it's impossible for us to just do the right thing because it will be wrong for someone else. People whose religion is all about being good and right easily become righteous and judgmental. Have you heard of Thomas Merton? He was a Catholic monk, died in the 1960s. He said this, and this is one of the things our Lord came to reveal. Christ came to make it clear that human beings can, especially when they are right, especially when they are holy, especially when they are good, they can be terrible. See, it's better to be the kind of person that still has the capacity for making a few mistakes and being wrong and having to get back on your feet, clean yourself off and start over again. That is the better way to live because the person who's never made any mistakes is in terrible shape. So if there's anyone around here who's never made any mistakes whatsoever, please go and take a bath in some holy water or something. <laughs> Luke 18, 10, Jesus again. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like that other person, like those other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week and get, give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Our capacity, this is me again, it's not Jesus anymore. <laughs> Our capacity to create justice is one of the ways that we build the heaven here. It's important. Our capacity for loving kindness and justice is astonishing. Now, we reflect that onto God. We make God a judge. Ah, that's, that's wrong. But for us, this is how we, part of how we create heaven. But it's also our Achilles heel, because it can make us inflexible. And if we hold our principles so rigidly, 
we then trespass upon the hearts of another. Here's what I'm talking about. James Finley now, who was Thomas Merton's protege student. James Finley's still alive. James Finley says, there are those who hold that one religion is the true religion. And almost always when this occurs, the religion just happens to be their own. There is in the absoluteness of view a lack of humility, which closes us off to the way God works in the hearts and lives of other people in ways that are different than we are accustomed to. Humility liberates us from such notions. notions. This is why humility is so paired up with wisdom, that the wise person is the humble person. They know so deeply because they know the limits of their own knowledge. And the limit is actually the rich, fertile edge along which all the new keeps appearing. In Thich Nhat Hanh's language, this is to realize that every view is wrong view when it's held as the only view. James Finley is spot on in this statement, but there's a line that kept jumping out at me when I was planning the mustard seed sermon. He says, the limit of our knowledge is the rich, fertile edge along which all that is new keeps appearing. We'll come back to that in a minute. When I lived on the island of Iona, I lived in the abbey there, hence the fact that I always use their prayers when I come to see you, because I know that you appreciate that. When I lived in Iona, one of the things I did was tend the herb garden in the abbey grounds, and I grew quite a few plants that were it mentioned in the Bible, including mustard. And I noticed straight away it wasn't a tree, it wasn't even a shrub, it was more like lettuce, except for quite big. <laughs> mustard is in everyone's kitchen, it's ordinary and it's a common thing, and it grows like the blazes if you plant it in your garden, it will take off. And I'm sure that, like the Beatitudes, Jesus is turning the scales upside down and pointing out the fly in our religious ointment, inviting us to look deeper. We are being invited to see heaven in the mundane and the unsophisticated. Back to James Finley. The limit of our knowledge is the rich, fertile edge along which all that is new keeps appearing. It's a wonderful Zen Buddhist story. One day, a Japanese Zen master received a visit from a university professor who had come to inquire about Zen. And the master served tea. He poured his visitor's cup full and then kept on pouring. The professor watched the overflow until he could no longer restrain himself. It's over full, stop, no more will go in. The master stopped pouring and smiled at his guest. You are like this teacup, so full that nothing more can be added. Come back to me when your cup is empty. Come back to me with an empty mind. Richard Rohr, the Franciscan priest and brother that I love, says that in the second half of life, our job is to unlearn everything that religion has taught us. Our job is unlearning. How can we receive d divine inspiration if we already know everything? But it's not just about emptying our minds and refraining from judgment. It's about discernment and tapping into the divine spirit within us. Last time I came, I remember you, I know that you remember everything I said. <laughs> the last time I came, I was talking about Pentecost. And I shared how you don't pray to the Holy Spirit, you pray in the Holy Spirit. That there's an aspect of the divine within us. It comes alive. And here's the thing. The Holy Spirit needs openness and a willingness from us for it to come into fruition. We are given free will and a very sharp, discerning mind. We can operate as clever, independent units, as individual persons. But when we do that, there's not a lot of space for where more than one gather <laughs> for Christ to come. But also there's not a lot of space for, the, for spirit to bubble up from within. What's needed is humility and a willingness to make space within our lives, hearts, and mind for that which is 
as yet uncreated. The kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, but because the kingdom of God is in your midst. So the kingdom of heaven, we are told, is within and among us. We can choose to tend this by responding to others and this world as holy, your garden, the things that don't grow. And we can choose to be receptive agents of heaven by practicing mindfulness and engaging in spiritual practices, such as observing times of silence and deep listening, or actively creating a gratitude practice. I understand us to be co-creators of this world. Yes, we inherit, inherit limited choices in certain circumstances, but whatever life has given us, whatever cards we hold in our hand, is ours to shape, bless, and make our own. We are given free will. We can attend to loving kindness or the holiness in all of creation and each other or not. I'm getting ready to host an online retreat on St. Francis next month. St. Francis is a big hero of mine. I've got an icon of him on the guitar there. And he, when it comes to being the change that you want to see in the world and responding to this world with love, and only love is your agenda, he is a great role model for us. One of the early brothers with him said this about Francis. Francis did not so much pray as he himself became a living prayer. He stepped through that invisible holy portal where heaven was with him on earth. And I think Francis also teaches us that holiness starts small and with sincerity. Even for St. Francis, it was a slow transformation from the rich Italian kid who loved parties, fine wine, booze, luxuries, and ladies, to a man who understood that everyone and everything he met, including the worms on the road, was precious in the eyes of his Lord and Master. And so he did all sorts of small acts of loving kindness, from throwing fish back into the sea to selling his only possession, which was a Bible, after uh, a lady knocked at the door and her son was one of the brothers with him and she said she was hungry. So he and the brothers went out and sold their only possession, which was the gospel, so that they could buy food for her. Small acts every day. When I look out at the world with all its beauty and social problems, I remember to pause and drop deeper, knowing that neither God nor Mother Nature operates under conditions of scarcity or retribution. No, right here, underneath all that we humans do, is a world, a universe, filled with presence and healing, renewal, and sacred balance. And I believe that deep down at the heart of humanity is God's goodness. Evil is a player for sure. And so often, we fall from grace. But humans never lose the divine light to greed, hatred, despair. It just temporarily gets covered over. And we're always given a choice in the smallest and most mundane details in how we respond. A few weeks ago, YouTube gave me a near-death experience testimonial. And I was like, oh, that looks interesting. I clicked on it. And I spent the whole day, <laughs> well, not the whole day, but probably the whole morning, um, quite fascinated, learning from people who had died on the operating table or done stupid things and choked on their own vomit and were in car crashes and came back. And one thing that they all said was that they had a life review which is interesting because Islam, when I studied Islam, there's a belief that at, when you die, you will have a life review and you'll have to speak to everything you've done. And all the near-death experiencers said that in their life review, they were shown mundane, tiny details. But here's the thing, they experienced it from their own perspective as well as everybody else involved. So, for example, there was a young man who he was shown 
being with his friends, like maybe 14, and they shoplifted. And he also experienced it from the point of view of the shop owner, who this was the last straw, and he closed his store. Or a woman said that she was, this was an event that she'd completely forgotten, but she was back in the grocery store and she was checking out and the cashier um, had just been badly abused by the person in front of her. So she was gentle and kind and affirming and told this woman she was doing a great job. And she got to see the impact of that little 10 second conversation. Small mundane things. I once um, used to work in a bar, I used to work in a bar. And um, there was one night there was a guy at the bar after everything had closed. I thought he was a friend of the manager because everybody had been kicked out, but we were like three in the morning. It was a nightclub, right? So it was really late. Here's this guy. And he's sitting there and I'm cleaning up everything. And I say to him, while you're waiting, would you like a, a, a soft drink for free? And he said, oh yeah, I'd like a Diet Coke. So I made him a Diet Coke. You know, out the gun, it cost the company six pence. You know, I was like, mm. So I gave it to him and he drank it. And to my surprise, he didn't wait for the manager. He put the glass down and he walked out. And I was like, oh, okay. And in the months that followed, he would always come in and find me and ask how I was and try and help me. And I said to him one time, Chris, why are you so kind to me? And he said, well, many months ago, my life wasn't good. And I decided to kill myself. And then somebody gave me a Diet Coke for free across the bar. I was shocked. I'm still getting goosebumps telling you this random act of kindness that meant nothing to me saved this man's life. Back then, I was like, whoa, we have the impact to really change other people's lives for good or for bad. And I became a lot more conscious of doing random acts of kindness. Right now, I see it as how we do anything is how we do everything. That's what Richard Rohr says. And our life, the mundane small details, is our biggest act of prayer. What we do co-creates Christ the kingdom or selfishness and separation. We have that choice in every time we go to the supermarket. Don't get me wrong, I make mistakes, we all do. I make lots of mistakes. Healing and forgiveness are built into us though, just like branch falls off the tree, the tree heals, we heal, your knee will heal. <laughs> um, it's built in to us. We, we don't, perfection is not what we're going for here. It's about slowly, within our means, building the kingdom. Another hero of mine is Mother Mary. She's probably the best teacher in how to humble up and say yes to God. Now that story of the angel coming and her saying yes, and then Christ appearing in her womb. It's so enormous that I think that we don't take Mary as a role model enough, but the way that she humbly said yes and aligned with God's will in the details I, is, is really powerful. And the, I'm going to sing the Magnificat, which is that uh, prophecy that she made after she said yes to the angel. She makes this prophecy about the coming kingdom. And it's called the Magnificat. The Magnificat means magnify. And I believe that our tiny loving motivations are like magnified by, a, by the Holy One. So that it's true when we die there will be some kind of review of the tiny details that brought kindness and, it, and healing and wholeness to society as a whole. And I really want to include the creatures and the earth in this too. We are all one giant earth. So let me sing the Magnificat and then we will uh, join together in song, in affirmation of the fact that heaven is within our reach. It's right here. It's a simple as a mustard seed. My 
soul shall praise and magnify you, Lord. Yes, I will come. Yes, I have come. I'm getting nervous because you're all looking at me. <laughs> I, I, I wrote this song, I know it, but I just got nervous. useful and throw away the rest. <laughs> We're going to sing um, a song that I love. I hope you know it. It's Simple Gifts by, it's a, uh, a shaker song. And I went to the last shaker village in Maine when I was training as a boat builder. You're invited to stand if you would like to and feel free to stay seated if you'd prefer that. <laughs> Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of the valley light. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend.
at the part of the surface for announcements. Does anyone have announcements? Oh, yes, 7 p.m. on Zoom, there'll be a session meeting. And then on Tuesday, 7 p.m., there is the book club meeting, book group meeting. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. Never mind. Um, coming soon. <laughs> Any other announcements or misinformation? <laughs> oh, which is it? <laughs> I'll try and remember it correctly. I just want to invite you all that you're welcome to come to my online. Like people say, where's your church? My church is online. And um, the St. Francis thing that I'm doing, you're welcome to come to that. It's a four part webinar series. It's on the um, 11th, no, 8th, 11th, 15th, and 18th of July. And uh, yeah, it's on my website if you're interested. Yeah. If, um, Simon, please send us a link. We can put it in our Oh, email. great. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, Jim. Right. So, right. So there's a uh, fellowship gathering at the Meltdown Restaurant at 5:30 p.m. on June 24th. If you have any questions, contact Janet Vermeister. Anything else, Sandy? Oh, congratulations! So for those that couldn't hear. Sandy and John are celebrating their 64th wedding anniversary on Tuesday. Tuesday. Congratulations. And may all people say, um, thanks be to God. Yes. Um, other joys or concerns? Jim. So I found out last Sunday that my friend Susan and we are now prepared for it passed away. So that's uh, Fran, uh, Jim's friend Susan who passed away. Prayers for their um, family. May all people say, uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Diane? Yes. So, um, to thankfulness, uh, Diane is thankful that she got over her birthday. No, that she had a splendid <laughs> birthday celebration, and it was a very festive night at the barbecue. And then special thanks, Jennifer, for all your years of service and dedication to the church. And, and we are grateful for your recovery. So let us all say thanks be to God. Caroline? I was just thinking, as Simon said, if we're, when we get to wherever we're going and they talk about all the acts of kindness, I, I just say that I better start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so Caroline's thankful that it's never too late. Never too late to start the acts of kindness. So um, let us all say thanks be to God. Oh, yes, in case folks don't know, Liara had um, um, an accident in her, her knee. That's why she's tucked away there with her leg propped up. So prayers of healing for Liara's knee. Uh, let us all say, Lord, hear our prayers. Any other prayers, concerns, joys? Each week we pray for a different person in our family. Uh, this week we pray for um, to keep... Bruce Donovan, in your prayers, gracious Lord, we give thanks for him in his presence in this congregation. Hold him in the palm of your hand and let him feel your love. 
Give him the wisdom and the strength to do your will and the faith and courage to face whatever challenges may arise. Uh, we also pray as part of being connected to Presbyterian Church and PNNE. And this week we have prayers for the General Assembly 226. Um, and that will be from June 25 to July 4th. We pray for all the moderators, commissioners, and staff. invite you to say with me the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have a wonderful, enormous basket here. That, um, if you would like to put donations in, um, you, might, well, you might need to put them under a stone or something. But um, I just want to mention that in case you want to give a donation. And also, I know that many of you um, tithe to the church on an ongoing basis. And I would like to bless the money and the care that you put in to the work of this community that ripples out through acts of kindness to the whole community. There's so many things you do, like showing up at Pride. Thank you for doing that. Um, sacred One, you know our motivation before we do. You see everything before it happens. You are in and before us. You see who we are becoming. We ask that you receive the gifts of money, time, and care that this congregation offers collectively and use that to bring about your kingdom right here in Berry, Vermont. Amen. Amen. Do you want to sing the doxology? Yeah. I'll do a cappella. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures high and low. Give thanks to God in love made known. Creator, Christ, and Spirit, one. And one more song for one more hymn for us. Make me a channel of your peace. It's in here somewhere. I invite you to stand if you're able. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair in life, let me bring hope. Darkness, only light, and where there's sadness, ever joy. O oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. are pardoned, in giving to all that we receive, and in dying we are born to eternal life. O Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. Standing, does that mean we're at the benediction? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we 
may the blessing of God rest upon you, and Christ's peace abide with you, and the Spirit illuminate your lives, now and forevermore. Thank you. I'll sing one more. Encore. Oh, I think it's called a postlude. I like encore. <laughs> Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. shining stars to you. Deep peace of the sun of peace to you. Moon and stars pour their healing light. 